trying to advance the objectives of hardware, best way to find information is to Google SQL Saturday, or being SQL Saturday, <laughs> Until February 21st, you'll submit an abstract. Usually, if you're local, you just select it to present. There's over 500 people that register. Your sessions typically are smaller, maybe 20 to 40 people that you'd be speaking in front of. We would love to have somebody from this. Cool. Thank you for that. Anybody else want to plug their meeting, presentation, job posting, anything? Cool. We'll all open up it again at the end if you, something comes to mind and you want to share it. Uh, but otherwise, we're about to get started. Uh, for those of you on video, uh, unfortunately, we cannot screen share, but I've got my web camera open up pointing at the monitor, so that's the best we could do. Uh, but at least you can hear with us and maybe follow along on the slides afterwards. Uh, but if that's all, then I think I'm going to pass it over to Mohamed and get started. So a uh, big round of applause for him going out, please. All right, thank you, everyone. Do you guys hear me in the back? Cool. All right, uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm uh, a professor at Arizona State University. Uh, my training is in, uh, my PhD is actually in data science and big data. Uh, in the past few years, we've been working uh, in my lab at ASU in uh, building a technology called GeoSpark. So today I'm gonna be telling you about this technology a little bit and also some other related technology around it that we built and we're so excited about it. So let's get started. Uh, so my, let, let me just like, my name is Mohammed, but my friends call me Mo. So you can call me Mohammed or Mo, whatever you, uh, you think it is. Uh, but please don't call me Professor Sarwood. I've been called that all time today. So don't call me that way. Anyway, so let's get started. So first, so the title of the, of the talk is Optimizing Systems for Geolocation Data, uh, the GeoSmart Story. So first, I'd like to like kind of remind you, like let you know what uh, geospatial data is. So in the past, when people think about geospatial data, they think about satellite imagery data. They think about uh, maps of cities, maps of uh, anywhere on the globe, right? This is basically what when people think about geospatial data, uh, or what used to think about geospatial data is. And based upon that, as like similar to a lot or other types of data, there have been systems that have been built about, uh, around geospatial data. They're built to process that data, to manage that data, to store that data in a database. So there are, for example, spatial databases, something like Postgres has a PostGIS, which is the extension for geospatial data. Uh, we mentioned Microsoft SQL Server. They have a geospatial data extension to handle geospatial data and process it. And on the other hand, there are also some visualization tools that existed out there that visualize data on, on maps. And we have, like for example, Esri, ArcGIS, all these kind of uh, famous uh, or popular uh, GIS tools that exist out there to handle geospatial data in some way or another. So, uh, however, these kind of systems, even though they handle geospatial data, but they were built with the classic assumption about geospatial data, or with the implicit assumption that geospatial data is just a simple maps or simple uh, shape files or tiger files of the road network of the US, and that's it, or the world. So there are some turning points that change that perspective a little bit. And the first thing is that that happened like, what is it, 20 years ago, something like that, or 15 years ago. So the idea of having like a device that is turned on all the time and you move, you move with. So that, that was actually a turning point. And I'm going to explain why in just a second. Also localization technology. I'm talking about these devices that you can move with. They have, you have some sensors on these devices that can know your, almost your exact location within like five meters, precision, something like that. That includes GPS, includes Wi-Fi, includes Bluetooth, or a combination of this technology to localize you. 
And this technology has been, is currently used actually by so many applications. And then one last thing that was actually a huge turning point was actually an announcement that happened uh, in, on July 10, 2008. You guys remember that? That date. It's actually, I think it's a historic date in the history of computing in general. It's when Steve Jobs came out on TV and announced the uh, iPhone. That was the same, the very day that he announced that. And a lot of people think, oh man, this is just a phone, it's just a cool, like, that looks nice. And looks, it was not that way. The iPhone came with a huge, huge invention, which was, which was the App Store. So after the invention of the App Store, there are so many, it started with like, what, like a, a thousand apps in 2000, 2008, and now we have millions of apps. And given the combination of all of that, again, a mobile devices with localization technologies and again a phone that can, you can install apps on, today almost every single app on whatever kind of device you're using has a location-based kind of service that it can provide to you that you can see explicitly or it's running in the background with something that something that you may not like, but that's a separate story, right? So I'm talking about every single app from Instagram, from Facebook, from Twitter, to uh, obviously the obvious example is Lyft and Uber, Google Maps and Yelp, all, even dating apps, right? And like all of it has some location-based technology. So what do I mean by that? That these devices, we are using every single one of us almost. We have some sort of this device carrying around and collecting information. So think of it that way. We're walking around and we're dropping kind of uh, breadcrumbs of geolocation digital traces as we move around, pretty much. What did this create? So these are examples of the apps. So we have Uber, for example, these statistics are actually from six months ago. It could be more these days. So we have about 15 million rides per day. And Mobike, Mobike is a large bike sharing company in the world. It's in China. And they have around 10 million rides per day. So think about the amount of data that is collected on a daily basis, not on a daily basis, on even a second basis. It's humongous. It's way beyond the classic data, geospatial data that we used to look at in the past. I'm talking about just simple maps, uh, cartography, and all that stuff. So what, like, what, what did that mean to us? If I am a data scientist, or a person who's trying to process, kind of wrangle this kind of data, right? So what do I need to do? What kind of systems I need to use to be able to process, to do whatever kind of data science task I'm actually want to apply on this thing. So the first thing to ask ourselves, like the first thing I'll do is like I will go and try to use one of the existing uh, systems. I'll take, for example, SQL Server. I'll take um, other systems like Esri or ArcGIS or any of these kind of technology. The problem with these kind of technology is that they were not designed for that scale. So try, for example, to load the data collected from Uber into, on ju in just two days, into ArcGIS, Esri. I'm not sure if, how many of you are familiar with ArcGIS, Esri. All right, how many of you are familiar with the C SQL Server, right? Okay, try to load this data into SQL Server. Well, you can but try to run a query on, these, on this data. It's just, it will die for the most part, okay? So the question is, how can we run geospatial computation efficiently on such massive data? That was the first question. So one solution, like also that was about 10 or 10 years ago, we had like, or more than that, we had Hadoop. So we can use Hadoop to process this kind of data. Or after Hadoop came, came out, 
uh, it has some some issues, especially when it comes. It was scalable, but it was not too fast still. So Spark was kind of uh, the next step, and it came also in 2012. So let's look at Spark and how whether it's actually back then whether we can use it to process geospatial data or not. So Spark back then, so it did not provide. I'm talking about like it did not provide any geospatial data processing APIs. What I mean by API is that a programming API for the data scientist to load geospatial data, manipulate it, and run algorithms on it. So it did not have an out-of-the-box kind of library for geospatial data processing. So, so many, like, and if you wanted to implement that, you had to write like hundreds of thousands of code, lines of code, to be able to run geospatial data as a data scientist, which is again not feasible because if you're working in a company, you don't want to write, do that much engineering while you should focus more on the necessary engineering for the data science task you're applying. Since it didn't have, let's assume like, okay, like a very smart data scientist that will just write code very fast, like spent a year and wrote that that kind of processing, data processing API for geospatial data. The problem is that this may not actually be very optimized still. So if you don't have a data processing API that allow the application, uh, allow the data scientist to kind of use some building blocks for geospatial data, processing geospatial data, you will not be able to optimize that within the system itself. Why? The data scientist doesn't understand how a system like Spark work internally. So it will, he will not or she will not be able to, pro, to actually optimize the code, to optimize for speed and optimize for scalability as well. So what we did, we saw an opportunity here. When we looked at this, we saw an opportunity. And the opportunity was, okay, can we take a system, a very promising system called Apache Spark, and kind of hack the core engine of it to make it support geospatial data at a, efficiently at a scale. So that was the very motivation when we started a few years ago. When we started, uh, Apache Spark also started a year before us. So it was not as prominent as it is today. But we think like its popularity today made the need even for our technology. Even, even, like, made, like made it even, even uh, clearer these days. So what we did is that we took Apache Spark, we shaped the engine, right, and then we built what we call GeoSpark. GeoSpark, again, it builds upon Apache Spark, but to support geospatial data. This is just a summary of what GeoSpark can do. So GeoSpark is a cluster computing system. That means you can actually, if you have a cluster machine, of machines, of nodes, you can load any amount of geospatial data into the, into the cluster and run any kind of geospatial data or data science task on the geospatial data you have. It will, be, it will scale as long as you have enough machines and it will, besides scalability, it will also run very fast. So you as a data scientist, you don't have to sit at the terminal for days to get the results of the analysis you're running. So we have here, GeoSpark, it also can interoperate with other technologies. It just doesn't have, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Because we know that data scientists, they're familiar they're already familiar with some of these like existing technology. For example, you have databases like Postgres. It connects also with Microsoft SQL Server, with Oracle, the spatial extension of both of them. It also can load data like uh, NASA, if you have satellite imagery data, still can be able to load it in the format NASA uh, stores the data in. GeoJSON format also, like from MongoDB. Uh, Esri format, which is also the company uh, very big company that works in the geospatial kind of arena. And other, other things, like other ways as well. Beside all these kind of techniques here, we also allow 
in GeoSpark for extensibility. So extensibility means that you can actually load different kinds of data and we allow you to actually also extend the system to load different formats. On top of it, as a data scientist, I know where I'm loading the data from, I load it to GeoSpark. And on top of it, we give, we provide geospatial data processing APIs in different formats. Depends that actually tailors to the data scientist kind of expertise and needs. So we have an RDD Scala API for somebody who's familiar with these kind of uh, languages. More specifically, somebody's familiar with Spark very well. But even if you're not, on top of it, we provide a SQL API, geospatial SQL API. So if you're an SQL nerd, you will be able to kind of deal with the data. Beside all of this, we also recently provided a Python API. So if you want to interact with GeoSpark using Python, you can also do that. And you, the, the cool thing about this is that you don't, once you load the data into GeoSpark and use Python, you don't have to worry at all about the internal internals of the system, how data is stored, how data is processed, how data is indexed, partitioned across the cluster. You don't have to worry about any of that at all. It's just loaded and you just worry about the logic of your data science task or algorithm you're building. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of how it works inside. All right. So uh, inside, GeoSpark has a layer called the Spatial RDD layer, Spatial Resilient Distributed Data Set. And basically this stores, just think of that as the data structure that you store the data in, and the data structure is actually distributed across the cluster. So it's partitioned and distributed across the cluster. So you can, inside of it, you can store geospatial data, geometrical shapes, because again, geospatial data is in space, so it has geometrical boundaries sometimes, like points, polygons, rectangles, whatever it is. Polygons can be, for example, the boundaries of a county or anything like that. Points can be where uh, Lyft picked me up today for the point. On top of it, you have a spatial query processing API where you actually can run query prop, like some queries or process the data, filter it, join it, integrate it. There are, these are actually provided to the developer out of the box. Sorry. On top of that, there are the basic APIs, the RDD API. <coughs> this is Java and Scala. And on top of it, there is a query optimizer to optimize the queries. And then you can also have a spatial SQL API that an optimizing spatial SQLs automatically for the application developer. So again, here we have a support for heterogeneous data types. Again, data comes in different formats. It can be geospatial, rectangle, point, or whatever, and it can be non-spatial as well. So also we provide support for these. The data is cached in the base memory for actually performance, and there is a compact in-memory representation to not for scalability as well. So we have data compression to keep. I'm not going into the details of that, but it actually, as compared to the bare spark, it can actually reduce it by 10 times fewer, uh, 10 times less, or less, one order of magnitude less than spark itself. Also, the data is automatically inside GeoSpark is automatically partitioned across the cluster, and this kind of partitioning techniques actually takes into account the load balancing across the cluster, and it takes into account also how can we get the result for you faster at the top. Spatial data partitioning, again, not going into the details, but it's actually happening behind the scenes. The application developer doesn't see what's happening, but again, it optimizes the flow of data across the network and across the machines in the cluster. So we implement some of the state-of-the-art data partitioning techniques. Again, these are just example of data distribution of taxi trips across the globe. Uh, these are, think of them as Uber rides. And these are different techniques that we allow for partitioning. And we automatically decide the partitioning scheme that will make the processing of whatever data science tasks you have the most efficient. So again, all of this is happening in the system internally. We also have an indexing mechanism so that 
we can decide which piece of the data that needs to be accessed now and which piece cannot be accessed, uh, does not need to be accessed now. And this will also speed up the query execution. So for the spatial query processing layer, we also have different uh, operators that we implemented. One of them is one famous operator is called the spatial join operator. Spatial join, basically think of it if you have two data sets. One data set is uh, the lift pickup pickups today, and the other one is the buildings that exist in a city. And you want, to, and these are two to, totally two different data sets. And you, as a data scientist, you want to integrate the two data sets together to find the building that had the most pickups at this time. Very simple task, right? Aggregation task. So integrating these two data sets based on the location is called a spatial joint. Very, very important, and it's used in very basic and also very complex data science tasks uh, that when you run on geospatial data. So we have a very, very optimized, op uh, very optimized implementation of these. And again, when you run the spatial join algorithm, it runs very efficiently across the cluster again and minimize the amount of data shuffle and again, return the results, integrate the data at a way faster rate. And actually, uh, again, I'm not going into details of the algorithms because I, like, I don't want to, I want to talk about more stuff. But after you, you implement your spatial, like let's assume you use a spatial SQL as the main language for running your spatial, uh, the data science task, we have an optimizer we had the catalyst of Apache Spark. You can write a SQL query like this. And this SQL query find all the taxi trips, uh, integrate taxi trips data with Google Places, and find all the taxi trips with passenger, only one passenger in the taxi, close to a uh, hospital. So that's, that's what the, this query does. We actually, it's a very complex query. You can, it has selection, has data filter, it has join, has so many of these things. We have a way we actually hack the catalyst to support geospatial data as well. So this is how geo, uh, Apache Spark work inside, and we actually integrated new geospatial statistics and geospatial SQL expression heuristic rules to make it work efficiently for geospatial data as well. So this is, for example, in Spark, the capture join query plan, and this is the original query plan. It just shows how we can actually move from one optimized plan to the other. And without going into much details, so GeoSpark performs this kind of data integration tool uh, function. And actually on close to 2 billion GPS data points and 200,000 polygons together in three minutes, less than three minutes on four commodity machines. So let me just give you a, an idea. If you run that just on Spark without using GeoSpark, it will take close to 10 hours to run the same task. And here it takes three minutes. So I'm just giving you an idea of the difference you can achieve. And again, for a data scientist, eventually, even though uh, the algorithm matters and the accuracy of the machine learning algorithm user or anything like that, but if you just want to do a data integration task, which is the very first step, and it will take 10 hours, I mean, that's not fun. So this is just to show you, like, uh, we implement, like, we already have a, if you're familiar with Apache Zeppelin, Apache Zeppelin is a visualization tool, notebook. So we have several notebooks created for Apache Spark that you can try out. Uh, I'm not gonna try it out now, but I can give you the link later. If you guys wanna play with it, run some SQL queries, some uh, Python code as well, you can also try it out. So we have, this is the RDD API. Here you can create an RDD, you can uh, join data together, filter data, show the results. This is the SQL API. You can create a data frame, then you can select things and apply some geospatial statistics here and show some uh, that Zipline can actually visualize some of the data in your county. There's also, this is the join query that I talked to you about, and it also visualizes the result on the map. And this is also building a heat map on top of all the taxi trips across the United States. 
And uh, this is the code to do that. We also have an extension that can actually build something like that in Node in uh, Zephyr. So just to give you an idea, uh, we've been working on that for a couple of years, and this is the state of the software as it is right now. So we implemented the software, we published the software on GitHub. So far, we have about, uh, on a monthly basis, the software is being downloaded like 10,000 times on a monthly basis. And this is, these statistics are from uh, Megan Central. So it's from a third party, we don't just collect these statistics. Not only this, uh, we've also been tracking who's been using the software. So we have some people, some of the companies out there that are using the software in production. Example of these companies are Mobike. Mobike is using uh, this software to do geospatial data science. More, one example of one of the things they use is that they have bikes being rented or shared across China and they want to find the distribution of the bikes being picked up at every second, right? A live, a live feed of how distribution, how bikes are being picked up in different parts of China. So they use the system for that. We also have Uber using the system. They use the system to do uh, a task called a data science, a geospatial data science task, very specific called map matching, to try to have some GPS traces from the Uber trips, and they have a map and they want to kind of match the location to the map. So they use GeoSpark, they build machine learning algorithms with GeoSpark to actually do the map matching. We also have Apple Maps using it, we have different other startups, we have AT&T using it, and so uh, one insurance company called the American Family Insurance is not here, it's using it for uh, actually they're collecting data about uh, weather issues and some other uh, uh, natural disasters happening in the U.S. and they try to actually predict the risk for locations. Yeah, risk prediction and also to account for uh, the policy cost and all of that beforehand. So they use it also as a building block. It's not the only thing they use but GeoSpark is a building block in the data science kind of stack, they have to do that kind of task. From an academic perspective, so there are some a third party uh, academic uh, group that did a benchmark on geospatial data analytics system. And this is, I'm quoting them, they say that GeoSpark comes close to a complete spatial analytics system. It also exhibits the best performance. So they mean performance here, they mean efficiency and scalability uh, in most cases. So they did a very rigorous review of the system. So before uh, before I continue, do you guys have any questions? I want to make this a little interactive, if possible. Please. I have a comment. It's a pretty big deal. Right? Because a few years ago, they had their own internal tool that was based off of Presto or something. So we are talking about Uber. Uber. Yes. And so they're actually adopting your guys' tool now. It's Yes, uh, I'm gonna tell you a story about that. So one of their engineers, uh, they were actually, uh, one of their engineers, she was a, uh, she went to Facebook. You know, but this person just started with Facebook. So she worked at Facebook and then moved to Uber. And she was in charge of building the Presto kind of uh, pipeline of Uber. But the idea is that she, this that was a couple years ago, a year and a half ago, something like that. She, in fact, started contributing code to GeoSpark, and now she replaced a big bunch of the Presto code in Uber with GeoSpark code. Not totally, they're still using Presto at some points, but uh, some part of the production is used actually, they use GeoSpark code. I actually gave a talk later, uh, I guess, Two years ago, in uh, Uber, uh, Uber Maps, the Maps team, and they showed me how they used it. I was impressed. They used it in ways that I would have never thought somebody could use it with. So, but they're very, they have really engineers there. So, uh, you're right. Yeah. 
It's pretty so it's uh, open source, right? It is open source. What we want to be open source, right? So there is a version that we keep open source. There is another version that we are trying to commercialize, right? Uh, and you can have a discussion about that as well, right? If you guys want to figure out how to commercialize or something like that. Another question, please. visit Uber, uh, they showed me how to use that. Again, just to clarify, GeoSpark is, think of it as a, as a system, a software system, as a programming tool. You can use it in whatever uh, direction you can use it for. It, as, it depends again on the, what the data scientists want to use it for. But one of the things, but they didn't show me the exact algorithm they use it at Uber because that's kind of, a, what they call it? A secret sauce they have at Uber, the whatever kind of uh, intelligent algorithm they use, they use it actually to study the, not alone, but they use it as part of the data science stack to study the, uh, the behavior of the, uh, the people, that, the writers, right? When you increase the, uh, the distance they're being, between the location they're being picked up at and the uh, and the relocation, so they're testing the behavior. Behavior means like, will you cancel the ride? Will you uh, like cancel and do it again, or do something like that? How you interact with the app in that sense. So there, you again, GeoSpark doesn't do that, but you can use it initially to kind of actually find the distance and filter things based on the distance and then run some algorithm on top of it, right? To do that kind of thing. But yes, you can use it for so many of that. Please. More on the analytics, yeah, more on the analytics, I would say. Uh, so more, like, the user of GeoSpark is uh, a data scientist. So that's that, that's our main user, which, like, many of these companies, every company these days, they need, they have a data scientist. So it would be more on the analytics side, but what I'm thinking about commercialization is actually a, another question, is okay. actually, which is, Shall I provide this as a, again, since this is open source, so everybody, everyone, every one of you, I actually heard, like, please, after this presentation, you guys please download it and play with it. Uh, not only that, I mean, like one, one more thing, along with the kind of commercialization kind of uh, topic, get back to that, uh, Databricks, Databricks is the main company behind Apache Spark. How many of you are familiar with Databricks? This is great. So, uh, well, you two years ago, all about. what's that? <laughs> two years ago, nobody knew about Databricks, right? So, Databricks, they now actually provide a notebook. So, if you have a Databricks account, you can actually log in with your account, and they have a GeoSpark notebook inside there. Why they did that? Because they realized so many of their customers used to use Spark, so they wanted to provide that tool for them. For us, even though they have that, and they use our open source version to do that, uh, we have more than just the open source version. We have like a lot of, not just optimization, also a lot of uh, APIs that we propose. Uh, 
uh, four specific use case applications that we have, uh, but we, for commercialization perspective, we're still debating whether we're gonna make it like, uh, what is the, the Red Hat model or the Dataverse model, right? So my recommendation is, like, if, if I'm just making a decision myself, I think the SaaS model is the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Because the SaaS model, you still having one, this open source is totally fine, but on the other hand, I'm also providing a service for the data scientists who pay a subscription fee on a monthly basis, and you can actually get this. And not only that, the SaaS model can make it easy to partner with Databricks and other cloud service providers like Amazon and uh, Azure, Microsoft Azure, any of these kind of uh, things because our customers, we will tell them that, you know what, if you want to use our system, our tool with Amazon or with Azure or with Databricks, we are allowed to do that. We partner with them and these companies will be okay because we're gonna kind of have a revenue share. Yeah. So I believe that's the way to go. We're still debating, but uh, I don't think the old model, like selling software in a CD or even online, it doesn't work. That doesn't work anymore, right? Please. So, kind of like what's your preferred way to get the GPS projects out of What was that? No, we are actually we have inside this one also. We are allowed to do that as well. You can load the data. These are also part of the uh, perks we have. You can load the data as text, and we can actually uh, geolocalize that for you. We have some other. There's huge, in the research kind of, uh, in academia, there's a huge research on how can you get from text, get the geospatial location. And we have, we, are, we already have some implementation for all that stuff inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, there are so many algorithms. What we do inside, so many algorithms. No, 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 I'm not kidding. You're right, fuzzy matching, you can use fuzzy matching. But there are so many algorithms that can actually give it text. How can you get the geospatial coordinates? And inside GeoSpark, we have a library that actually implement about 15 of these algorithms. So the data scientist might say, so let me use this algorithm today. Because they, he's a data scientist. We also assume the data scientist is not a, is a smart guy or a smart gal, right? So they know what they're doing, even though we're implementing things for them but at least we're giving them the building blocks to choose from. So yes, there are, we have, we have implementation for 15, for 15 algorithms. I can share the papers with you that for each of the algorithms that we built for sure. But we didn't come up with these, for, for these kind of algorithms, they exist out there, we didn't came up with them, we just implemented them in the system as a perk for the data science. Because we think that people think that about that. Is it, like I don't want to spend time going to Google API and getting that and pay for it. No, it's there for you. So it's free. It's kind of an Not in the open source version, okay. right? Yeah, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Please. Uh, you mentioned that you'd be able to use GeoSpark to kind of leverage whatever means you're trying to do. Uh, is it restricted to only using geospatial data, no. or what kind of data sets can't you or would not want to use GeoSpark? It's a great question. So, uh, so GeoSpark, even though it's very, very specialized in handling geospatial data, but it's also, it doesn't ignore the fact that sometimes geospatial data comes with other types of data, like text or uh, JSON documents, and you might even have like relational data, typical relational data or anything like that. So it actually optimizes geospatial data with other types of data as well. But why we specialize in geospatial data? Because that's our uh, niche, right? But yes, it can work with both. You can use it for both. So if you have an application that just works on geospatial data, GeoSpark is the best. If you have an application that works on geospatial data with other kind of data, I'll say GeoSpark is the best. If you have an application that has no geospatial data at all, GeoSpark is not for you.
Right. Other questions? Please. You were saying how you can optimize around the efficiency. In terms of formatting the data when you can insert it into the table, I did a lot of work on it. I'll say the data is going to click on it and turn it into a GPM and see the And then I have a geometry column. So now I have a essentially a data frame that has a uniform type of geometry to that data frame. And then I might have a data frame with points, and I might have a data frame with the geometry and its column lines. In terms of the optimization, do I need to format my data in a certain way so that it's stored separately like that? Or how is the data stored? We are in the, this is in the open source version, in the new release that's coming out in two days. We are actually having a full-on conversion from a data frame to GeoPandas, uh, Shapely, and all that stuff. So that way, you don't have to worry about that at all. As a GeoPandas uh, expert, or a person who really know what to do with GeoPandas, you'll be able to use GeoSpark with, uh, with that. In other words, you can, for example, you can have a data frame, which is, again, it's a table, and GeoSpark columns and has geospatial data. You can say convert this to GeoPandas for that, and then you can take it and you can apply the same exact function to use to use GeoPandas the same exact way. And the other way around too. So you have the GeoPandas. Uh, you're using GeoPandas. You can convert it from that format to either a data frame or RDB API or any of the APIs you have. And we believe that that feature, even though we were like kind of in the beginning, we were excited more about SQL and RDB and all this stuff. But users think this is actually the best feature ever, right? Yeah. So uh, just a little bit of time in a case like that, that would be really cool to me because um, I'd like my view, my overall process of using uh, GeoStar because there's a lot of data here. Yes. Then you might have a, a product that's a more simpler product. Yes. Yes. Is that perfect? I mean, I, I'm not, I'm speaking. I'm surprised actually that we have you guys are. Uh, I like. I didn't expect to, to have people that know GeoPandas and all that stuff. But man, this is this new feature is designed for it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Other questions, please. Um, how's that handling aspect of the data problem? <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, the temporal uh, aspect in the open source version is another attribute. In the closed form version, it's actually we have instead of spatial indices and spatial just partitioning, we have spatial temporal uh, indices and partitioning. So that it's actually way, way more efficient, even. Yeah, especially if you want to run uh, tasks that filter data based on space and time at the same time. Some things. You had a question first? Can you give an example of how this really drives that economic side of business? That's a, that's a good question. So, um, so we gave already several examples, right? That how this can be used in a company. Can this on its own derive a specific, like, an entire business. All the companies that we actually talked about here, all these companies, uh, GeoSpark does not derive their business, which means it's not a cash cow for their business, right? But it's used in mostly doing analytics on the data that will help, uh, how can I say that, increase revenue. So it's used indirectly into increasing the revenue. So this is why I want to ask who's the user of this? Who's the user even in Databricks? Uh, Databricks, the main user of Databricks is actually not an end user. It's actually a data scientist, which is one, a team working in one of these companies that will use that system to increase the revenue so, example of applications. These are these are applications that can be used also uh, in several businesses. 
So here, for example, uh, if you're like American, we're, we're recently actually talking to American Express, but this is from a research perspective. So they're trying to, like, they're going to fund my uh, research lab at the university, and they're trying to actually do detect fraud. But they want to detect fraud based on the geospatial location of where it happened at the time where it happened as well. So that's one, one kind of application that can be applied in for retail, like site selection, urban planning, uh, foot traffic analysis. So you have a lot of data collected from that. You can use it also for applications like that. You can use it for financial services, for healthcare, uh, disaster recovery. Uh, and this is exactly not the same. Also, predicting disasters, natural disasters, this is what the American Family Tree is using for, which is definitely saving them a lot of money. Defense and intelligence, infrastructure, uh, energy, all of these applications, if a company is working on any of these kind of sectors, can actually directly benefit from GSPAR. But GSPAR is not going to be the main. Uh, cash cow for, for the company, but it will help, it can be used for analytics that will actually increase the revenue of these companies. And this is similar to a lot of the uh, data enterprise software that exists out there. They're using that, including Databricks, including also uh, some of the things running on Amazon AWS or all of that. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a really interesting question. I was actually talking to one of the main developers of uh, GeoSpark today, and I was telling him, dude, I mean, can we just like uh, do like a live visualization of that, where you can actually look at the map and look at things because s s some of that existed already. Uh, but I wanted him to actually not just do the spread based on the CDC or anything like that. I wanted also to integrate that with a lot of other geospatial data so that you can actually look at interesting patterns, right? So we didn't do it yet, but I mean, I think that's a very interesting application for, and the customer in that case, if somebody wants to do that, would be a government or would be like, again, um, uh, somebody who's trying to uh, study epidemiology or where a company is trying to find a vaccine or a cure or anything, they want to study how that, how things are going on in, in the world about this kind of uh, virus. This is an interesting application. So other questions? How, how, how is what? How is what? Um, that's relative, right? That's <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's pretty easy, right? But if you are not familiar with, if you've never done any kind of cluster computing before, it can be a little more, like, a little challenging. But what we can do for you, and that's what we will be doing, hopefully, when we start the serious virtualization of this product, is that we're going to be creating instances on Amazon, AWS, and all that, so that for you, it's like a notebook, you log in, and it just like works for you. That way, you don't have to set up anything. You can tell, you can tell me, oh, I want to use your software. And my favorite cloud provider is uh, AWS. Just go and set up next for me. And we can do that. But now, if you want to set up, like, if here in the company, you want to set up, you want to buy a bunch of machines, build a cluster, and set up things, you can still can do that. And we think it's easy, but it's, if you've never done any that in your life before, it's going to be a little bit of complicated. Well, just just for exposure to, to actually start to understand how to use this, if I wanted to install it on a single unit, I guess it's a little more complicated. On a single unit, you, I think it's pretty straightforward. Yes. If you follow, we have and, uh, again the uh, GitHub. We have uh, we have documentation, detailed documentation how to install. We have also several examples. Uh, sample data sets for just one machine to play with uh, yeah, to play with the system. We have all of that. But again, I'm talking about like 
real, real kind of cluster thing. If you have real big data and you're running things, it, it's a little bit different, right? But again, we will we will be actually trying to uh, avoid that, especially when it comes to like if you have a customer you want to make sure that they don't uh, go through a lot of uh, trouble to, to to deal with this. Other questions? Please come. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. He, he asked the question. Uh, you know, guys first. Okay, go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm talking from a dashboard or real time uh, visualization perspective. So yes. I have, uh, let's say, one day time window and I'm uh, having some, some kind of map plotted. Yes. Uh, and I want that dashboard to update every five minutes or every 10 minutes. Uh -huh. So the next time when we run the query, the window shifts, right? So if the query is going to take the same amount of time that ran before, so that kind of That's a fantastic question. Again, GeoSpark itself, the core engine, we don't do that. Core engine focuses more on the, uh, if you have a very big analytics task and you want to actually optimize that. But on top of it, we assume that a lot of people, especially with geospatial data, they will use a dashboard visualization dashboard like Tableau, for example, or any other existing techniques that you want to visualize, interact with the data, and look at the results and all of that. So, and we assume that you use GeoSpark, uh, get the data, process it, and then bring it to Tableau, visualize it, and then go back, get a new kind of data, new population, uh, visualize it, fix the dashboard, change it. So that's, that's, a, that's a hassle. So a dashboard looks like this, for example. Uh, you build a heat map, Let's say this is, uh, again, tax trips again, or let's assume it's a coronavirus kind of cases or anything like that. So here, the piece, you can change the filters here, and you need to update the heat map, and for example, you need to update this linear regression kind of on top of that, because it's based on the new filters. We, uh, we looked at the existing approaches, and the strong end approach is to, most people sample the data in order to reduce the size of the data, and make things very fast. However, the different approaches to sample, sampling, the first approach is definitely no sample at all. You use the entire data. It will take forever with every kind of click you have on the dashboard to change the heat map or change whatever. It will take forever because the data is in terabytes or petabytes. So it's not scalable. There's another one that does sampling, but it does the sampling first. Sampling first means that I have a petabyte of data and before I connect to GeoSpark and connect tab low, I sampled the entire petabyte and into one gigabyte. I don't care, I just sampled it. So that's one technique, right? And then you can load it into uh, tab low and interact with it. It would be fast, right? But the problem with that is that you lose a lot of patterns, visual patterns that way, because you reduce the size of the data so badly. So example of that is here. So here are some patterns here, for example, you can, even though you catch the content patterns, but some patterns are actually, they disappear when you reduce the size of data that early on. Another way you sample on the fly, and never, whenever a part of data is being visualized or being placed, uh, visualized on the dashboard, you sample that only that part of the query that represent the filters. So do the sample for each request, scalable visualization. However, it's a slow data systems query. Why? Because you need to query the data, do the sampling before you pass it to Tableau. So it's slow also. So to solve all of that, we actually built another platform on top of GeoSpark. It can work with GeoSpark, but it can also work with Microsoft SQL Server as the back end. It can work with other database systems or Oracle or Postgres or any kind of database system in the back end. It's called Tableau. It's not Tableau, it's Tabula. So the idea here is that it's a sampling middleware that sits between the data system, the data management system, and the dashboard to handle that sampling and do it in a very efficient manner. Very efficient means, sorry. So very efficient means here, we want very accurate data, like visualization of the data on the map. The heat map needs to be accurate that shows the real patterns of whatever is happening now. 
And on the other hand, we also want it to be scalable and we want the visualization to be fast. We want to retrieve the data to be visualized fast. Because again, there is a human sitting at the dashboard who's not gonna wait for hours to get the results. They wanna see something interactive, seamless interaction with the dashboard, visualization dashboard. So the system that we build on top of, that can be used on top of GeoSpark is called Tabula, and it does that. Uh, how does that? That's a huge other story. I have a full research paper on that. I can share it with you. Uh, and that can also, part of the commercialization, that can be one of the products that can be also on top of GeoSpark. Please. Why are you using different visualization packages for each example? No, you're right. I mean, this, this is misleading. No, we said this is OR. You can use Tableau, you can use OR, ArcGIS, oh, or Zipline. Okay. Down there, you can use PostGIS, MySQL, or SparkSQL. This is not, it's just OR. It's misleading. Sorry about that. So the, the, the middleware that we came up with worked with any of these. As long as the database systems or the data management system uses SQL, that should be fine. That will work. Please. Yeah, if this is more of an observation than a question, this seems like something that would be incredibly valuable to uh, a business that is, they use UPS for FedEx, for example, right? Um, so when we talk about geospatial data, do I have a start point and end point? Or do I have, you know, 100 points, including my start and end point, and something better to get around one of these applications? Um, and in my mind, I kind of start focusing on FedEx, UPS, Deliveries, right? So, critical information, real time dashboard. I'm thinking of, you know, a mail manager who's okay, I've got 100 packages, 1,000 packages I got to promise to deliver. Now I can see in real time where maybe there's a problem. I mean, I should set the back of the truck to address the back of his truck to help spread it and do something going on. Perfect use case. Yes. Perfect use case. I agree with you. That could be really useful for them for the scale they have as well. I have no idea how do they do it now. I'm not sure if they actually totally do it in that sense. So, uh, not sure. Yeah. We've been talking, there is another uh, fleet management company in the Valley. I don't remember the name. Uh, it's my bad. I don't remember their name. But uh, they what they do is that they install... Like if you're if you're if you're a company of running fleets, they help you install like kind of devices that will track the cars or the vehicles or anything like that, and they can show you a dashboard of how things going around. But the scale they work with is at most uh, 150 cars. That's that's the best they can do to show you that kind of interactive dashboard. They're making the it's a successful company though. They're big and they have like I guess. 200 engineers working there, so it seems like they're, they've been doing well, even if that's small. Yeah, I believe so. I don't wanna, yeah, I believe so, yeah. It's, it's what I like, the original owners, they're not with the company anymore, so they made a lot of money initially and now they're enjoying their life. Yeah, so yeah. Other questions? I mean, yes, GeoSpark, we also, uh, around GeoSpark, we built several libraries that can help people. So if you want to simulate traffic in a huge city and you want to, to use it in your data science, right? Uh, GeoSpark, there's an extension called GeoSpark Sim. It's a library that built on top of GeoSpark that allows you to do that. And it's, again, out of the box. You can just say, I select the city of Metro, Metro Phoenix simulate traffic in this area for uh, three hours from 8 uh, p.m. to 10 to whatever, whatever, 11 p.m. And it will do that for you. And you can use it whatever you want to use it for, the simulation. Yeah. Other questions? So I had other stuff here to talk about, but I mean, I'm, I just I'll stop at this point because I don't want to bother you guys with more technical details. Uh, I hope I was, uh, I gave you just a little bit. Uh, 
you, now you at least know a little bit about GeoSpark, you understand how it works, what is the need for it, what is it good for, what is not good for, right? So, uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can definitely, I'm not sure if you have my email. Um, do you have my email? You don't? I can send it out to everybody. Yeah, please send my email. I also have my Twitter. I, yeah, I like, I'm very active on Twitter. So, like, I mean, I will, if you send me a message, I will respond. Yeah. If you don't have any other questions, I will end it here and then I'll let you enjoy more food, right? You want to see the future work? All right. So this is not necessarily related to the but the future work is mostly uh, we worked with a humongous amount of data, but now we want to also work with fast data. Especially a lot of use cases that exist in the business out there is actually these days is uh, IoT, Internet of Things. So a lot of people, a lot of internet uh, IoT devices out there, and these IoT devices installed in a city or something like that, a lot of geospatial, a lot of spatial temporal data is being collected. How can you plug these devices into the system and do the analytics on top of them? Uh, there are a lot of challenges to doing that with existing data analytics systems anyway, uh, including GeoSpark. So what we're working on these days from a research perspective is that how actually can we, again, uh, change the streaming layer of Apache Spark so that it supports very high multi-source data from IoT devices. That's one, uh, one thing we're working on. Another thing about future research work, if we're going to follow from a commercialization perspective, if we're following the SaaS model, uh, there's still a lot of work that to be done to be able to allow this. Uh, why is that? Because, yes, this can run in a cluster and everything like that, but when you run it on AWS, it's totally different than when you run it on Azure, and how can you make it work in the cloud? That's also another challenge. So, uh, it's mostly engineering challenge. So, if we can do that, that's also another this is also another direction for the future. Yeah, for the future. Please. You guys scare me because I believe you talk to the developers I work with because this. No, no, no. I feel that you guys know things I mean, that we talk about uh, uh, to the developers. So yes, we have a plan for uh, part of the, that's, that's part of the visualization dashboard. So the idea here is that many of the times you had so many other like interactions with the system. So we collect these interactions and we apply, we actually have an algorithm. It's still not in production or anything like, or not even the open source version, but we apply uh, deep reinforcement learning to be able to predict what the data scientist will, the piece of the data data science will ask for next. And based on this prediction, prefetch and make the, even the program way, way faster money around. So we, we are working on that, but nothing out there yet. Okay. Other questions? Or other comments? We have uh, we have an engineer in mobile. He's uh, one of the he now he contributes back to GeoSpark, uh, and actually they implemented a full extension. I guess they can recognize this to R, and uh, it's like version like zero point zero something. Yeah, yeah, we are we are in contact with him and trying actually to ask him to. Uh, just change the uh, the way the coding kind of convention is using or something like that to be able to push it into the main branch of the uh, use part. But he implemented that and he's using it in mobile. Right? So it's uh, the good, a good thing about it. Also, we think that the software is healthy when you have a community, right? So we have a community of about, our community grew to uh, the last two years core members of the community who develop and push code back. There are 40 members. 
and many of them are actually software engineers, data scientists in these companies that I've just mentioned. Because they use it then, they extend it, they contribute code back. Some of them are a little selfish, they use it, they extend it, but they don't contribute the code back, but what can we do? Pretty much. It's like, oh, it's free software, it's pretty cool, and I will use it, but yeah, I'm not going to share my code with you. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. It happens. So far, this decision is uh, solely taken by one person. We can predict who that person is, right? Yeah. So, uh, but uh, it depends again on a lot of things. Some, some, of, some of the features we got out uh, in the juice part version, the, the open source version, we got we got it out initially because we wanted to all we, we were a bunch of like a bunch of academics. We want just people to use our software. I mean, we, don't, we didn't care much about commercialization in the beginning, to be honest. So we wanted to make impact in the world and we wanted people to use our software. Uh, but now it was like, we, like when, we put, when we put it on GitHub, we didn't expect that much traction, honestly speaking. I mean, we thought it just like, a lot of people post things on GitHub and you figure that one person downloaded or like every couple of months or something like that is nothing, right? But we were actually kind of, uh, we freaked out when we saw that, man, we have like 15,000 downloads of one month or something like that. That's crazy, right? So that's why we thought of a commercial as we saw that. We saw like the people see value in it. Uh, I believe the reason, that, like, so, so, that, so we didn't think about that. So that's why many of the initial things, I would have made it not in the open source, but it's already out, right? <laughs> so I cannot like, I cannot, take it, I cannot take it back now, but a lot of the other cool stuff we're building, it's, we're very careful these days, we don't just like push everything, it's like, yeah, it's already, uh, like, it, the software is already, like, got the popularity, uh, we, we wanted to get more popular for sure, but it got enough popularity for us to guys, start doing something, like, for real, right? Other questions? So who wants to work? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm good. I was going to say, if no one else says anything right now, feel free to come up afterwards. But I've, we're, I've been on an hour and a half, so I think, uh, I think we'll formally call it, and then people want to stick around for some questions. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just finish my beer. So. <laughs> yeah. He needs another beer afterwards. All right, uh, thanks so much. Well, uh, Right on. So uh, just a little bit, and then I'll let you guys kind of go about or ask no more questions if you got them after me if you get another beer. Um, uh, just a reminder, uh, anybody have any last minute announcements, anything they want to plug, anything like that? I know Connie mentioned SQL Saturday. They're looking for speakers for that. I think it's in late April. So keep your eyes out for that or just if you want to attend even. Um, any job postings? We at New Desk are always looking for new talent, especially cloud engineers. Um, so if you are interested in getting involved um, with something in that relation, we're just looking to get involved uh, in any of our internships or anything like that, just come up to me and I'll make sure that you get in contact with the people you should be talking to. Um, anybody else? Cloud engineers. Nice. So you're a cloud engineer and want to become one. Now's, now's a good time to do that, I guess. Um, otherwise, validation, again, just follow me over to the desk. I'll make sure that you're good to go. Um, I'll get out the box and make sure that you're all set up. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for coming out. Please, please invite your friends to be coming out to continue to support these awesome presentations. If you yourself want to present or know somebody who'd be good, feel free to let me know so that way we can get those conversations going and continue to have these awesome presentations. Plus, the free food's nice, too. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I think we're going to call it. So thank you guys so much for coming out.